Hosea is an individual that is asked to live a parable and that the life that he lives is a representation of how Israel is towards God, towards Jehovah, towards Yahweh. And I don't know about you, but what it, it sounds tough. It really does. And the parable that he is asked to follow through is, is one that we would not, we run from that. If God asked us to do that, we would say, uh-uh, I don't think so. That's not, that doesn't sound like something I want to do. Uh, but Hosea did it, you know, and, and so we're going to jump right into a time for change. Now, hopefully, as the elections come, that the outcome is going to create a season of change. We're hoping that this endeavor to end inflation or reverse inflation or to change what we've come to experience will be better going forward. We are hopeful that the leadership that is elected this week will represent the leadership of our values. And sometimes that's not such an easy thing. Hosea three or 6, verse 3. Let us strive to know the Lord. His appearance is as sure as the dawn. He will come like rain, like a spring shower that water the land. Now for most, this is a definitive image. Maybe not today with the thick fog that we drove into to get to church. Uh, you know, with the limited visibility, my wife said to me on our way in, why does your dashboard keep flashing brighter and dimmer? And I'm like, that's on a photo sensor. So when the fog is thick, less light is coming through, that makes the dash lighter. And when the fog is not so thick, there's more light coming in and makes the dash brighter. And it's like, as you drive through the fog, that, that transition, what's that? It happens several times from the gun club to the turn off to Mike's house. It's all that heavy breathing. But as we look at the image of Hosea in this verse, we, we often welcome the spring showers as needed for the land. We often welcome this image of the change of seasons. And in this passage, we recognize that the water brings forth life. Hosea 11. Now, Hosea, if you actually endeavor to read this, it's kind of a bigger uh, minor prophet. It's, it's not a small writing. And it... This passage is, you know, substantially deep into Hosea, where it says, when, when Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called him. The more they called them, the more, de more they departed from me. They kept sacrificing to the Baals, and the burning offerings to idols. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them in my arms, but they never knew that I healed them. I led them with human cords, with ropes of love. To them I was one 
who eases the, the yoke from their jaw and bent down to give them food. Now the image here is that of Israel being brought out of Egypt from slaves into a land flowing with milk and honey. The talk about Israel is the northern kingdom that broke apart from the line of David. And Ephraim is the most influential tribe of the northern kingdom. Sometimes Ephraim does mean the northern kingdom. And so this reference of Ephraim, which happened you know, to be a, an influence in this, this is this, this discussion about idolatry the worship of idols, when it talks about the Baals, they departed from me and worshiped idols. That is what we're learning in this passage. And they don't realize it was I that taught them to walk and it was I that healed them. They don't understand these principles. So you need to know this. Verse 12, when the Lord spoke to Hosea, he said to him, go marry a promiscuous woman, promiscuous wife, and have children of promiscuous, promiscuous, yes. For the land committed blatant acts of promiscuity by abandoning the Lord. The, again, the image here is adultery and idolatry are similar. That's the image here. So he's called to take an unfaithful wife. And that represents the relationship that Israel has with Yahweh. Yahweh being the husband and Israel being unfaithful. So he went and married Gomer. All right. I wonder how that interview went. How did he pick a woman that met the Lord's description? I think that that's a Sunday school lesson that sometime in the future we should have. How would you take that? How, I mean, never mind. Maybe. Or the bar. Or any number of places. After she conceived and bore him a son, the Lord named him Jezreel. For a little while, I will bring bloodshed of Jezreel on the house of Jeru and put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. On that day, I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. Jabez. That's something else. Yep. But Jezreel, this is, this is a a forecast of defeat. This name represents a forecast of defeat. You're to name him something that represents Israel's coming defeat. Fred, how would you have liked to have been named something sad? Like you represent a coming defeat. Would that appeal to you? Yet this woman allowed the dad, husband, to name this kid something awful. It's like, you should be slapped. Like my wife slapped me just a moment ago. <sighs> or worse. I'm glad we can laugh in the house of the Lord. She conceived again. And gave birth to a daughter. And the Lord said, name her no compassion. For I will no longer have compassion on the house of Israel. I have certainly taken them away. But I have compassion on the house of Judah. And I will deliver them by the Lord their God. I will not deliver them by bow, sword, or war, or horse, horses and cavalry. All right, so, again, the oldest boy is named 
for an upcoming defeat. Now the daughter is named No Compassion. Vicki, how would you have liked to have been named No Compassion? Doesn't that sound awful? How in the world can you sleep at night naming your kid this? This is what God told me to do. I have to do what God tells me to do. I am no longer going to have compassion on Israel. And yet, it does not end. After Gomer had weaned no compassion, she conceived and gave birth to a son. The Lord said, name him, not my people. For you are not my people and I am not your God. I don't know about you, but these are fighting words. This is your paganism has gotten to the point where I am not. You are God, and you are not my people. Yet the number of Israelites will be like the sand of the sea, and which cannot be measured or counted. And the place where they are told, you are not my people, will be called the sons of the living God. The Judeans and the Israelites will gather together. They will appoint for themselves a single ruler, go up from the land, for the day of Jezreel will be great. Again, the reference for upcoming disaster. So we have upcoming disaster, no compassion, and not my people, all in the same household. You didn't get that. Even Mike got that. We have an upcoming disaster, no compassion, and not my people, all in the same household. <laughs> and a wife that looks at her husband and says, how in the world do you think like this? <laughs> yes, I got it. And it was actually kind of in, in, in line with where we were at. <laughs> so in chapter 2, we get this image of upcoming disaster. Call your brothers, my people, and your sister, compassion. Call my people, and compassion. There's a slight change here. Call my people and compassion. This is a play on words. Maybe something is going to change. Maybe something is going to happen. Rebuke your mother. Uh-oh. Rebuke her, for she is not my wife, and I am not her husband. Let her remove her promiscuous look from her face and her adultery between her breasts. Otherwise, I will strip her naked and expose her as she was on the day of her birth. I will make her like a desert and like a parched land and I will let her die of thirst. I will have no compassion on her children because they are children of promiscu promiscuity. Yes, their mother is promiscuous. She conceived them and acted shamefully. I don't know. This is not a good day. This is... This is a struggle. Go tell your mom she's wrong. <laughs> I don't know. That does not sound like a formula of success. Mom wavers. 
Yes, their mother is promiscuous. She conceived them and acted shamefully. For she thought, I will go after my lovers, the men who gave me food and water, my wool and flax, my oil and drink. Therefore, this is what I will do. I will block her way with thorns. I will enclose her with a wall so that she cannot find her path. She will pursue her lovers, but not catch them. She will seek them, but not find them. Then she will think, I will go back to my former husband. For then, it was better for me than now. She does not recognize that this is I who gave her the grain, the new wine, and the oil. I lavished on silver and gold on her which she used for bales. Again, the image of a idols, idol craftsmanship, the, the image of blessings that are not given account to God. Sometimes you and I, we think we've earned something. It is our hard work that allows us this or allows us that. We think that we are this or we are that. And it is here that in this passage of Hosea it says, she didn't know I was blessing her. She didn't know that the blessings that she had were mine that I gave her. Sometimes you and I got to recognize the blessings in our life are blessings that God gave us. And that we need to have a grateful and thankful heart. And not be eager to take credit for the many blessings that we have in our life. And we need to make sure we don't use our blessings wrongly. In this example, the wife used some of the blessings to craft idols. We have to make sure that our blessings are not used to craft idols or used painfully in the wrong way. And then there's a return to grace. Therefore, go. I'm, I am going to persuade her to... Lead her to the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. I will give her vineyards back to her and make the valley of Achor into a gateway of hope. There she will respond as I did in the days of her youth, as in the days she came out of the land of Egypt. I will call in that day, this is the Lord's declaration, you will call me my husband and I will no longer call me my bail. This is a change in which the Lord will be seen as God in this relationship and not abandoned. This is a return of the house of Israel to Yahweh. This is an image of a wife who's left and now returning. And the blessings that were will be reinstated. This is a passage of hope where hope has been removed. For the, I will, remain, I will remove the names of the Baals from her mouth. They will no longer be remembered by their names. Think about this for a minute. When we walk away from our past, that thing that kept us connected to the old life, that needs to be buried that thing that connected us, that needed to be hung on the cross and crucified and abandoned. As we repent of our ways, we repent of that lifestyle that we walk away from. We will no longer worship those idols in your life. All of us had idols before we came to know Jesus. Some of us may still have idols in our life that we're trying to control or manage or ignore. But we need to abandon those things and forget their names. Now, I can tell you from my life, I was big into hard rock metal music. That was my idol. I did not want to abandon my idol. When God and I had this conversation, I was not prepared to give up my idol. I could give up lots of other things, but I did not want to give up my idol. It was firmly placed in my heart. And the Lord said, 
If you don't, I will not become closer to you. You need to give this up to become closer to me. So I had a choice to give up my idol. What does it mean to no longer remember their names? I went home. I packed up all my hard rock albums. Put them in the closet. Scraped up $10. Back when $10 could buy you something. Went down to the Christian bookstore. I bought my first Christian album. Mommy Don't Love Daddy Anymore by the Res Band. Back then they were called the Resurrection Band. That was the Christian hard metal group. And as conviction set in my heart, and every month went by, I scraped up another $10, bought another album. The voice kept saying, you still have the idols in your house. You still have the idols in your house. So I had to take those idols out. I hung them on a tree. Vinyl. Vinyl. Back when vinyl was in. Came back, but back. And I, and I took out my bow and arrow set, and they became target practice. All my vinyl shattered. And I had friends that said, why don't you give me those? I'm like, I can't give you my sin. I had to destroy it. I can't give you that. You will. The change has to occur where we no longer remember their names. There has to be change in here. Just like Just like when the wife said, I'll return to my husband. She thought it was going to be easy. But there had to be something that had to happen. Something that had to happen. And as the return comes, the Lord says, on that day, I will make a covenant with them. With the wild animals and the birds of the sky, with the creatures that crawl on the ground, I will shatter the bow and sword and the weapons of war in the land. I will enable the people to rest securely. I will take you to be my wife forever. I will take you to be my wife in righteousness justice, love, and compassion. I will take you to be my wife in faithfulness, and you will know Yahweh. There is no other imagery that gets as close as imagery as husband and wife as the image of God and those who worship him. And so idolatry and adultery are similar in the eyes of God that we can understand and we can relate to. On that day, I will respond. This is the Lord's declaration. I will respond to the sky and it will respond to the earth. An election is not enough to change the direction of this nation. And for Christians to motivate themselves once every four years to elect somebody is not enough. We need to be heard more than a season of election. The fact that we can mobilize and get our people out to vote is a good thing. But we, not, we need to be more than just voters. We need to be active vessels. Of Christ. We need to be active in our communities. We need to be active in our places. And we need to offer a new covenant. We need to offer grace. And we need to forgive if we've been wronged. Offer counsel when it's welcomed. And sometimes when it's not. Because sometimes they don't want to hear. But they need to know. How can you expect success if you do things poorly? How can you expect? All right. Everybody here can cook, right? Anybody here not cook? I'm probably the one that can't cook the most. 
Fred, have you ever used a recipe? Unsuccessfully many times. Okay. Okay. All right. So we're going to make something. All right. And we're going to make something. And we're going to get the finest ingredients of that. Let's make a cake. Okay. My wife does not want cake. What do you want if you don't want a cake? You're shaking your head no. What would you like instead of a cake? How about a pie? Would you like a pie instead? Coogan? Okay, so we're going to make Coogan. Okay, so we're going to make a Coogan with the finest recipes. What are we going to put in this? Help me out. What are we going to put in this? Cream. A lot of cream. Maybe fruit, maybe cause cheese. Sugar. Strawberries. What else? We're going to have some type of crust. We've got to make some with crust. Flour. Okay. Anyway, you, you, you get the idea that there's a recipe in which you're going to make this quiche, right? And let's say somewhere along the line, we're going to add Coogan. I'm sorry. Did I say quiche? I'm sorry. That, that's a Freudian Smith slip. All right. Anyway, but let's say at the end of all these ingredients, we're going to take three teaspoons the worth of cow manure and add it into the ingredients. How many of you want to eat that? Why? Because you've got bad ingredients in it. So when people are throwing their lives into the sewer, it's the same thing as taking cow manure and adding it to the recipe and making something that is mostly 99% high quality stuff, but you add 1% of cow manure to it, you got something nobody wants. Just being told makes you say, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. I, I don't, yeah, I don't think. Anyway, the point is, sometimes when somebody's making those choices to put ingredients in their life, we're not going to go down that road. That was from Ben. Ben had the question. And it turned out okay. Apparently. Anyway, so sometimes when some people are putting manure in their life and they're expecting a positive outcome, we have to let them know that this is just like making that item with cow manure that will ruin the outcome of what you're trying to create. So sometimes we have to find a nice way, a loving way, to give them godly advice, even when it's not wanted. It doesn't mean they're going to receive it, but it's still sometimes necessary. And of course, when it's explained the right way, it might come out halfway OK. So hard is in the right place. But a time of change is coming, and we need to do more than just vote. We need to be vessels of change. And revival starts here. Starts here with us getting rid of our bales and calling upon the name of the Lord and being the person that the Lord has asked us to be. Do we have a closing song?